Uh, hey, everybody. For the record, my name is Joe Wood. I'm a specialist with the Energy Facility Site Evaluation Council. Um, Amy Hafkemeyer originally was going to do this presentation, but couldn't be here today. So I volunteered to jump in here and do it in, on her behalf. This is going to be uh, very uh, quick. Uh, I really only have six slides here. And the idea here is to just give you a, a very basic idea of permitting transmission line permitting uh, avenues in the state of Washington. So um, again, transmission permitting can get very complicated really quickly. So we really just want to provide a really basic high level overview. Um, uh, if we if we want to dive more deeply into different permitting aspects like SEPA and NEPA, we can do that at, at a later a later meeting. And as a caveat, uh, personally, I don't have much experience with transmission line permitting, so please uh, feel free to clarify or, or add things uh, during or at the end of the presentation. Um, so I'll start by saying one of our uh, tasks in the transmission corridor working group is to, and I quote from CETA, identify environmental options that may be required to complete the designation of such corridors and recommend ways to expedite review of transmission projects without compromising required environmental protection. Um, so uh, we, we really want to just give you this uh, generalized overview uh, because of that. So uh, next slide, please. So as you may have guessed, there are essentially three avenues for permitting transmission projects. Uh, there's the federal level, the state, and the local process. Um, the federal process generally consists of project review under the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. Uh, the, what, what we are defining as the state process here is certification uh, through the Energy Facility Site Evaluation Council, or FSEC. Um, that's actually a optional, uh, transmission lines in general are not required to go through the FSEC process. However, you, if, if one would like, they could opt into the FSEC certification process if a line is over 115 kV. Um, and through the uh, FSEC certification process, uh, we follow the State Environmental Policy Act and if necessary, also NEPA process. Um, the third, Third avenue is, is local permitting. And this essentially just consists of uh, jurisdiction by jurisdiction approvals. Uh, projects have to comply with local cord requirements and the associated siting processes. So uh, in that sense, it becomes a very piecemeal process um, of trying to get permitting done. So generally speaking, the federal uh, permitting process, oh, sorry, next. Next slide. So the federal process uh, consists of this NEPA review. Um, as many of you may know from past NEPA experience, it consists of a, uh, a determination of significance, a proposed action and a determination of significance. That significant, uh, that, that determination uh, decides whether or not the project moves into a full-blown EIS process, or uh, there is some other sort of determination, such as a, a, a finding of finding of no significant impact. Um, so the other significant thing about the federal process is that uh, it's required if the project is proposed on uh, federal property, or if the proposed action uh, creates what is known as a federal nexus. And an example of a federal nexus may be uh, a negative uh, effect on um, threatened or endangered species, for instance, or uh, say a wetland crossing. Um, those are examples of, of what would create a federal nexus, even though the project may not physically be located on federal property. Uh, the, this process is, is generally used for large scale transmission lines that traverse uh, large areas, especially uh, interstate. And please, uh, Anders and, and um, Lorna, uh, jump in and correct me if I'm wrong or, or add any, any additional thoughts you may have. So uh, one more thing that I think is notable about the federal process is that BPA is required to uh, follow the NEPA process by default. Uh, 
I believe because the, of their status as a federally regulated uh, entity. So uh, Andrews can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I do know that they, they do need to follow the uh, NEPA process. Um, so again, the typical steps of NEPA proposed action, the determination of significance, um, this, that decides whether or not a, an EIS is necessary. Uh, then there's a scoping pro process, uh, alternatives and alternatives and impact analysis, and then EIS, and finally a, a record of decision. Uh, moving to the state process, uh, FSEC has a process for permitting transmission lines. As I said, it's a opt-in uh, process only. It's not required. Um, FSEC likes to call itself a one-stop shop for permits because uh, through the certification pro process, one can essentially get all the permits that they need for, uh, for building the project. The, the FSEC process also involves, uh, in tandem with a CEPA or NEPA review, uh, a land use hearing and adjudication process to mitigate issues. Um, and I think it's interesting to note that this process is actually seldom used by transmission line developers. And um, we can talk about reasons for that uh, later on. Uh, moving on to, well, I have a second slide here, sorry, that is, uh, shows the, thank you, Rob, the uh, FSEC siting process uh, in a little more detail, but is showing that through the FSEC process, um, if there are, if there are, if there are parts of the NEPA, NEPA process that also need to be addressed during the certification process, that can also also be done uh, through FSEC. Um, okay, next slide. Finally, we have the local permitting process. And as I said, it's really just, um, it's jurisdictional dependent. Uh, each jurisdiction you are passing through with your proposed project may have uh, different uh, land use codes or building codes, siting procedures, and um, essentially developers of transmission lines uh, have to just start to step through those per permitting hoops uh, one by one. Um, interestingly, to my knowledge, this is the most common pathway for utility owned, uh, uh, for non-BPA, trans I'll say non-BPA transmission permitting. Um, and that's all I have, short, short and sweet questions and comments. Um, thank you, Joe. I appreciate that. Um, uh, Vlad asks, what's the benefit of opting into the FSEC for uh, eligible lines? Um, it sounded like uh, one-stop shop permitting was uh, one of the uh, responses. Joe, I don't know, if, or Kathleen or Stu, anything you want to add about uh, to, to address that question? What, what I would say is that it's a, um, a process that includes uh, multi could include multi jurisdictions in one process. So our process allows for local government to uh, that um, have the physical infrastructure in their jurisdiction to name a member to the council and to be part of that decision, really recommendation. So you would have the package of the um, entire project go as a package to with a recommendation to the governor. So it's a, I think, combines multi-jurisdictional process. Okay. Other questions uh, for Joe um, uh, on this presentation? Yeah, I saw a, a question about uh, from Vlad asking if it would, if it replaces uh, local permitting needs. And I think the answer is that, that uh, Yes, it, it um, through the certification process you would you would be obtaining needed local permits as well. That's correct. Great. Um, yeah, uh, Dana, please. Okay, thank you for that presentation. I just wondering um, when does the section one hundred six process fall into this 
site transmission line siting process. That may be, that is uh, probably a good question for Lorna, perhaps. I'm not sure the answer to that. Okay. Um, does, it, does anyone on the call um, know the answer to that? Uh, please just jump in if you do. Sorry, and Dana, I think it was probably just um, assumed if, if you go back to that, you're absolutely right, it's a great question. And for those of you who don't know what Dana's talking about, it's the Cultural Resources 106, and it's, it's you know on par with the environmental review. Okay, thank you. So I think, yeah. During the NEPA I, process. I, you, are, you are spot on, Dana, and it would be part of the NEPA process. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, you, and even in a CEPA you, process, Lana. you're going to still have cultural too. Correct. It would. Uh, thank you, Lorna. It would be part of the CEPA process as well. Great. Thank you. Um, and just and just for those that aren't used to environmental stuff, with Dana's point, um, I think somehow cultural gets lumped into environmental, like because it's like this is what all the review is, but but it is it's just confusing. It is to think like we have a cultural resource scientist who's actually in our environmental department it's like it's kind of all these reviews but it is i i totally hear dana's point yeah and and you're reminding me now that um that we are going to be making that language change to our charter when we talk about outcome number three as suggested by dana and uh, and others um there was a question of um uh uh, would you still need easements for the entire path, for example, a railroad permit, a was dot, wash dot permit, or for service easement, or is that covered under the FSEC um, permitting process? Uh, I think Kathleen may be a better. So um, let's be honest, we haven't done this, but I believe that any type of easements that a property owner or a project a developer would need would have to come. Um, in the work they do prior to coming to FSEC. Yeah, and this is Lorna again. We've gone through FSEC for a wind farm where we, we bought a wind farm from a developer who went through FSEC. And and absolutely what Kathleen said, there was there was a lease needed from DNR, for example, and that isn't part, the real estate rights aren't part of the FSEC process. 